thanks everyone for coming. Great to see you. Uh, I know there's a, there's a great program on today. There's lots of interesting talks. Uh, I looked at every single slot and I was kind of conflicted at every single one. Which one should I go see? So I'm very glad to see so many people who uh, came out here. Um, I hope you're enjoying the event so far. Um, yeah, I think there's a lot of interesting stuff going on. And I'm guessing the vast majority here are Jenkins users. So for you, there's going to be a ton of interesting stuff. Um, you have come to a potentially slightly heretical talk, just a little bit of a warning. I mean, if I were to give a, a sort of one sentence summary of what we're going to talk about is that shock horror, there is a world beyond Jenkins. Um, and to be fair, listening to some of the discussions going on, most of you uh, recognize this, and I'll talk a little bit about you know what the standard world beyond Jenkins is that we see, um, and, and maybe some some kind of nuances on that. So the, the, the kind of broad brush summary of this talk is um, we see a whole bunch of people now who are kind of saying, oh, continuous delivery sounds great. Ah, faster, better, cheaper. Well, who would say no to that? I mean, who have you ever met that says, oh, we're going to help you build your software slower. It's going to be rubbish and uh, more expensive. And that's all nice and good. But then you have to start to figure out, well, how are we actually going to do this? And a lot of that involves tooling. I mean. And we'll talk about this as well in a bit more detail. Of course, it's a big fallacy to believe that tooling will just do it for you. Um, but tooling certainly plays a large part in, in the, the underlying, if you like, infrastructure of what's going on here. Um, and as with any kind of tools kit that you need to assemble, um, there is a tendency to discover that you've got this amazing hammer that you have. and you know. If you just look long and hard at every single problem, it does turn into a nail if you just look at it the right way. And that's true, of course, not just for Jenkins. It's true of a lot of different tools. But looking at a whole bunch of different organizations and teams, from really small ones to really big ones, and how they've started to address these problems, then we, uh, we are going to see a little bit of you know what we have discovered works in what situations and, and what doesn't. And I guess what I'm trying to do here in the next 45 minutes or so is to transmit as much of that as possible. Um, I am not going to stand here and give you some blueprint for the magic solution that will work for all of you. Hopefully, you will come away with some questions that you want to ask about your current process, what you're actually trying to achieve, um, uh, what, yeah, uh, what you might want to investigate as a result of that to see how to make things better. So. Yeah, this is the, the long version of what I've just said. I am actually going to talk not just about Jenkins uh, here. Basically, you know, the CD, the, the, the challenges that you get when you try to do real end-to-end -end continuous delivery, not just like, oh, I've just built a new version of my app and I'm going to put it in a QA environment, but you really try and get it out to the, the customer, then there's probably more that you need to do than you can do with one single tool. Or uh, a lot of you here, I mean, this is the Bay Area after all, perhaps the most advanced average uh, kind of software development segment in, in the world, or at least one of them, um, a lot of you will already have done some of this or, or, or tried to do some of this and have run into some of the challenges that you can see there. So I mean, I've had this discussion with people in many different places. And in a lot of places, if you ask the room, so like, who's doing continuous delivery today? There's like one shy hand at the back. And here, it's slightly different. We can ask the question in a second. We'll see. But um, that means that for a lot, of a lot of people we speak to, that this is a relatively new kind of like Wild West challenge. Whereas I think for a lot of people here, you, know, you have experience with trying to do some of this. Um, and, and I think one of the things that you realize with any tool is if you, you know, Ultimately, every single tool in this particular space is a remote orchestrator, right? It can do stuff on machines. Uh, it all really depends on what kind of stuff it's particularly good at doing. And every tool, whether it's Rundeck or Jenkins or Puppet or you know, M Collective or Salt or Ansible, or the list can go on forever, um, they all have their own take on what particular task they're particularly good at solving and a domain model built around that. And I think a lot of what we're going to see here is that the underlying technology isn't all that different. It's just what is the domain model that that tool is good at, and do I need that domain model in my specific context? Now, obviously, we're big Jenkins users as well. Uh, unsurprisingly, this is a screenshot, quite an old one right now, of one of our uh, Jenkins installations that we run. I work for a, a product company called ZB Labs. We build CD and DevOps tools. And of course, yeah, we dog food a lot of our own stuff. Um, but of course, we don't build our own CI server. That would be crazy. Um, 
we use Jenkins pretty heavily. And, and that also helps us, of course, get a, a sense of you know, what works really nicely and what maybe doesn't work all that nicely. So some of the things we do, you know, we, we have a, we do some build failure stuff. We have a big matrix testing problem because uh, some of our tools, like we have a deployment tool that targets uh, 50 different types of middleware or some absurd number, and then each of those on Windows and Unix and some of them on ZOS even. Ugh. Um, and you can imagine what the kind of combinatorics of, of integration testing all that stuff looks like. So we have some interesting challenges there. And then you know, we try to do some CD internally in terms of making new stuff readily available to our end users, and so we have to do some build promotion, and yeah, we've got a lot of stuff going through our systems, a lot of VMs in use, so we need to do some of the throttling. These are some of our favorite uh, plugins that we're using. There's a, a longer article on InfoQ that KK uh, and I co-wrote a while back about you know, some of the pipelines that we've built, or we originally built with Jenkins, and it discusses a bunch of plugins uh, that are used in that context as well. Okay. So now to the slightly more heretical part. What happens when you start to hit the edges uh, of what your CI tool is particularly good at? And um, important point to point out here, this is not just uh, when do things start breaking technically or when do you start to find that there's too much glue that you have to put in from a technical perspective. This is also about when am I trying to get people to log into Jenkins and understand what it's showing who don't really have any clue what they're looking at. Like if you've ever asked like a release manager to log into Jenkins and try to figure out what the status is of a particular issue number and the build associated with that, then I think you, you may have run into the challenge of trying to explain to them, what are all these green balls? <laughs> and so, yeah, long story short, it's not just about what the thing can do technically, but whether it's presenting the right information to the right people. Um, for those of you who were at the CD Summit yesterday, there was an interesting presentation uh, by a guy from Momentum SI, he was talking about, you know, they're a, a CD consulting company, and one of the things that they try to help their customers with is understanding where the time gets spent in the entire end-to-end -end pipeline process. And um, uh, KK will probably say something about features that are being added to Jenkins Enterprise to try to make that easier, but he was saying, like, one of the challenges they faced, just to find out how long it takes from the moment a commit is made to the moment that thing actually gets into production, it's in pretty tricky. So they were talking about, you know, making all these API calls, trying to figure out the timestamps of when various builds started and stopped. And of course, not everything happens in Jenkins, and there's like a service now approval process. So you have to like try to, you know, basically it's doing APM on your continuous delivery pipeline to try to just capture something relatively simple. What's the throughput time from beginning to end? Um, and that's not stuff you really want to have to do yourself in that context. So Jenkins, of course, has a luxury problem here. I mean, not many tools are confronted with this issue that there are so many plugins and there's so many things that you can do with them that it's actually possible to extend a tool pretty much all the way. I, I kind of call it the Christmas tree problem. Now, you've got the Christmas tree, and there's just this temptation, oh, there's another little bauble I can hang on to. Oh, there's a little branch over there, and then there's another one. And eventually, this thing starts to get too full. And, and then there's a risk that it falls over. So, but I mean, it's a great situation to have. I'd much rather be in that position, of course, than being in a position where you have this amazing tool that nobody uses and, and it doesn't matter what it can do. Um, it is, uh, I've done this myself from a sort of development perspective. Of course you stand up a CI server, whichever one it happens to be, because you need to do that on your code. And then you discover, yeah, I know, ooh, there's another plugin that allows me to, I uh, do some, some quality checking, and then maybe, oh, there's a provisioning plugin. Maybe I can stand up an environment, and then, oh, maybe I can generate a kind of report. And, oh, now, well, there's no plugin, but there's an API. So if I do a little bit more work and I write some more scripts, et cetera, et cetera. So you, you know, it's possible to do all this. And like any other thing where you're trying to build out a uh, process from like the core, uh, like CD, you know, build it out from the build thing all the way to production, potentially. Every extra step is just another small step. It's just another job. It's just another three or four run script windows in my job. And it's sometimes you have to take a step back and have a look. How many of these have I actually built right now? So there's a bit of a sunk cost issue to think about here. So the, the onion, if you like, that I'm going to try and talk about here for a while is like these different layers of of complexity and challenges um, that we see if you try to build out an end-to-end -end continuous delivery solution. 
And the way the onion is sort of structured is that kind of what Jenkins, what I would consider to be the sweet spot of a CI server is sort of at the center. And as you move further and further away from the center, you start to get into challenges that you have to address, but that are perhaps less and less well served by what a CI server can do. Um, and you know, with the point at the bottom there, the, this is important to note, as I said, that this is not just about what it can do technically, but also about who in the organization you're actually gonna end up talking to. Um, these are online, by the way, I think all the slides, so yes, you're more than welcome to take notes. Flash photography, also much appreciated. You know, I like being, um, but yeah, no, you can, you can get those later. Um, Okay, so at the core, we have build and CI. That's what they're great at. Any CI server, we know it will watch your repository. You can check out the code. It will do pretty much anything you can imagine on the source code. Run analysis, build it, compile it, run unit tests, et cetera, et cetera. So that's all great. That's covered by existing functionality. Um, it's very robust. Uh, the domain models work really nicely for that. Um, then you get maybe one layer out, which is kind of like, okay, now I've built my tarball, war file, gem, RPM, Docker file, whatever your you know, choice of delivery artifact of the day is. And now I need to get that running in a certain environment. Um, or first of all, I probably need to have an environment in which I'm gonna get it running in the first place. I mean, we still work with a lot of people where you know, environments were one of these things created at the dawn of time and nobody really remembers how they were set up and most likely they're misconfigured because the team that used them the last time changed one of the JVM settings. What a surprise, and then stuff breaks. But um, <laughs> if you're laughing, then you know about this, so it's not that. Um, no, and of course people recognize this. They don't want to do this forever. So environment provisioning tends to be one of the more obvious low-hanging fruit things that people pick up um, when they start to build out a CD pipeline. And then, you, of course, if you want to get your app tested, you want to run some real like performance testing or some functional testing against it, you actually need to get an environment. So that's the environment provisioning bit. And then you need to get the app running in that environment. So that's what I would call the app deployment piece. Now, whether those two are actually separate processes depends a bit on how you're delivering your applications. We'll talk more about that later because there's a, a big spectrum of choices there. And then you go one level further, of course, because yeah, that's nice. You have an app running in like a test environment, for instance, but you know, that's only the beginning of your pipeline. The pipeline goes on. You have tests and then maybe you have like another set of kind of QA and then maybe regression. And then uh, maybe you have a funnel, you know, you're building 10 different components and then once a week or once a day or whatever, the, those that make it through the gate, they get integrated into the last mile and that's when stuff goes on its way to production. So that's really the, the release management or release coordination part of the pipeline, if you like, where you're typically still in a kind of confluence page, MS project, Excel spreadsheet, all that evil stuff um, landscape. Test management, well, I kind of glossed over that, but what that is all about is, yeah, um, the, the trend, of course, the more you want to do automation, the more and more you need testing whether manual, but most likely automated, to try to figure out whether the stuff that you're shipping is actually any good. There's nothing that like dampens your boss's enthusiasm for CD as much as a couple of high-speed train wrecks, you know, once a week or something. That, that really kills your CD initiative stone dead. So you suddenly have all these tests, and that's that's great. You more and more tests. You know, you might have Selenium and Fitnessa and Gatling and uh, Cucumber and you name it. I think the Roughly, the, the trend is moving away from something like HP ALM or HP QC, as it used to be called, one test tool to rule them all, to having this entire variety of different test tools. And then you start to get into the problem, oh great, I have a hundred tests in each one of these different tools, but they all together for my picture of, well, how good is this particular release candidate actually? So how can I actually look at all those tests as a unit? So that's this kind of test management piece of the onion. And then once you, you know, take that one step further, once you've figured out all this stuff and you, you know, you've made your decision that this application is good enough to go live and you've kind of analyzed all the information you have about it, then it's out in production finally, that's great. Um, and then you start to have to figure out, well, what are my users actually doing with this application? Because the whole idea, or one of the core concepts of CD, of course, is that you do this slightly hypothesis-driven development where you say, oh, look, if we move the shopping cart icon from the left to the right, then hopefully we'll get like more money. 
or uh, our users will be happier. They will tweet more about us or whatever your measure of you know, customer success happens to be. Um, and once you've made this change and it's made it through your pipeline and it's got into production, then you have to start to figure out, well, did it work? Did what I thought was going to happen actually happen? So you have to find some way of like, figuring out what your end users are saying, how they're interacting with the system, and so on. And again, you know, that's definitely part of the overall CD picture, but taking a step back and what, was the, the, what are we trying to do in this talk? Would you do that from your CI tool? How easy would that be? Kind of question mark. All right, so before we now drill a little bit more deeply into those couple of categories and, and what kind of tooling might make sense for those, let's remember that CD is a means, not the goal. Um, and the same goes for DevOps or a lot of other initiatives. So it's like, I'm, I'm a technical guy, so I love the idea of building like pipelines and watching buttons and stuff going logs all over the place. Cool. But ultimately, that doesn't pay for my paycheck and probably won't pay for the paychecks of most of you. You know, the, the reason we're doing this is because we can get stuff to our customers quicker or we can reduce the number of errors or uh, our competitors are about to do it, so we better do it before they do it. Whatever your underlying business reason is, you should know. Because A, if you know that, then you also know whether you're doing the right things. And also, um, it will determine what kind of things you need to do in your CD pipeline. To give you an example, we have a lot of our tooling runs on-prem. Um, and you know, whilst I would love to tune up our delivery system to like build a new version once every five minutes, our users would go crazy if we asked them to update their software every five minutes. Um, same goes for a lot of mobile people. I spoke to a bunch of mobile developers, and certainly back in the day where you had to approve an update for a mobile app, like if you ask your <laughs> your end users to like oh again oh again, you know they go crazy. So. The goals for continuous delivery, uh, of course, you can read a blog post about LinkedIn or Etsy or Facebook and say, oh, we want to do it every commit. But that's not really what works or makes sense in every particular context. So what we're going to talk about here is a kind of broad brush selection of things that we've seen as being useful in some situations. But yeah, as I said before, don't take this as a kind of template. Oh, look, the guy at the conference, he said, if we do all these things in this order, then stuff will be perfect. That's the, unfortunately not how it works. These are just ideas um, that you can apply if you think they make sense for you. <clears throat> so there's five, let's have a look at the time. I have to shift hands, I have about half an hour. So that works out fine. Um, we're gonna look in a little bit more detail at these five topics. And maybe if we get round to it, we're gonna do like a bonus six one in the end and that gets back to the kind of user experience measurement stuff. Uh, because I think you know that's going to become more and more interesting. Um, and one of the one of the things also to bear in mind here is that this is not just about what kind of tools you have, but also different people, different parts of your organization that are involved in this overall process. Um, and well, those users have different experiences, different needs, different types of expectations when they interact with tooling, and that's worth bearing in mind as well. I mean, if you, certainly if you're coming from like a Jenkins standpoint, you're probably used to working with people who understand what a build, what a CI process is. Um, and so the information that they see in a CI tool is pretty logical and kind of self-explanatory. But the CD process is pretty broad. It encompasses a large end-to-end -end block of your organization, some of whom may never even have seen a CI server, which is unsurprising since a lot of them run kind of under a podium like this. You know. Oh, look, here's my Jenkins um, on a Raspberry Pi. Um, so yeah, it, it's not just about, it's not just about the, the tooling. It's also about the people who need to look at it. There was a very interesting comment uh, a guy from Cisco made yesterday um, about a study that shows that also things like application architecture tend to reflect your organizational structure. So the way you design your systems also depends on who's responsible for different bits. And I think a little bit of this also you know, applies to a CD pipeline. You have to think about who's responsible for the different sections. So you know, the classic picture, I mean, this is just almost like a gag to try to shoehorn this picture into every single presentation that you can possibly imagine. If you ask different people, I mean, long story short, what's this about? If you ask different people what a CD pipeline looks like and, and what information it should present and what its purpose is, then uh, depending on who you ask, you're going to get uh, different opinions. Um, so, you know, as, as I've said, 
These are these are different people, and uh, yeah, if you talk to your DBAs, um, oh yeah, we're going to like roll out database changes from our source control in this pipeline, then some of them are not going to be particularly happy. Or you know, QA people may or may not know what a CI tool is. Certainly, operations, depending on the organization you work in, they may not be familiar with what a CI tool does, and so on. So, um, yeah, bear in mind different expectations uh, and different roles here. So. Yeah, the, this part of the talk, we're actually going to drill into each of those in a little bit of detail and talk about some of the things that uh, we've discovered are important, uh, they're worth looking at. There's not much to say about CI, um, that, that the basic stuff, like you should have a CI server, because that's pretty straightforward. Uh, I don't think any of you would be here today if that were not the case. Um, the one thing or two things that are worth pointing out about CI is that it's actually a process. It's not a server. Um, Having a CI tool doesn't necessarily give you CI, and I know Jez Humble has talked about this a lot, and there's plenty of uh, articles and, and presentations where he describes this in a lot of detail. CI is about integrating your code on a regular basis, which typically means, integration means merging. It's like merge often is really what CI means. Um, not run Jenkins against 1,200 branches that you have, none of which have been tested in combination. Because then you're not integrating. Then you're just running builds on 1,200 different branches. Um, what the CI server is really good at is helping you do this merging. But um, think about the, the fact that this is a process thing. Um, and of course, as CI servers start to become more and more important, they have to start migrating from the Raspberry Pi under the desk here to something that's reasonably well set up. I mean, this is no longer kind of like a development and experimental piece of tooling. This becomes a serious part of your organization's delivery infrastructure. If this thing breaks, if it runs out of disk space again on the hard drive, because, or if you know the network connection blows up because it's an ancient switch it's sitting behind or whatever, this starts to have pretty serious consequences for your organization's ability to, to work. So this stuff needs to be treated as if it were production software. It needs to be backed up. It needs to be highly available. I know there's a talk where they're talking about that in, in some detail. Um, and you need to be able to scale it out. As you start to do CD, you move from one build a, you know, hour, week, month, to multiple builds pretty frequently, especially if you're doing a pipeline, because it's not just the one build per commit, but that thing can kick off lots of other builds. So you need to have a lot of scalability, an ability to burst out and look at your profile of how many builds and when do the commits come in and you know how many builds are we running on average in at peak times. You need to set yourself up in a position where you have a scalable setup. You also need to be able to handle different types of builds because, yeah, in a, in a pipeline, you're not just talking about um, the code build, like checking out stuff on a local disk or on a, on a slave and then you're know, running I don't know, something to, to build the code and run some unit tests about it. You're also maybe having to log into remote systems uh, in order to run, I don't know, performance tests or deploy the code or these kind of things. And of course, uh, the bigger the pipeline gets, the more different groups of people need to start to have access to things. You start to have jobs that may have production credentials in them, um, you, those kind of things. So in general, it doesn't really work to have a CI server with one shared password admin admin for everybody or indeed no security whatsoever. Even if you trust everyone, there's also like regulatory requirements and that kind of stuff that uh, come into play here. Okay, environment provisioning. So what are we gonna say about that? Um, well, what we're talking about first of all here is not uh, finding a way to scale your CD infrastructure. That's also very interesting and important. And then, yeah, there's, there's lots of plugins and talks about you know how you can leverage something like Docker or uh, other cloud technologies to make it easy to grow your slave pool and make that efficient and fast. But this is really about, um, you know, I've built my code, I now need to get it running in some kind of a re reasonably realistic environment so that I can run some tests against it. Uh, and what you're going to need to do in your CD pipeline is obviously find some way to define these environments um, and instantiate them quickly and then also tear them down again. And um, so, of course, there's a, a trillion tools that will do that for you. You know, when you've got CloudFormation, you've got OpenStack Heat, you've got Tosca, which is the, the attempt to put a, a standard on top of those. You now have Terraform from HashiCorps, and there's a trillion of these tools 
uh, that will do this stuff depending on what your target technology is. But one of the things worth bearing in mind here, it's the data glue problem. Um, you take, for instance, uh, Terraform is a nice example. You know, it has a section at the end where it will print out whatever you wanted to print out about the machines that you've just created. And that's great if you're a user interacting with the system. Oh, look, I've now got four new machines, and these are the IP addresses, and perfect. But if you're talking about a CD pipeline, you don't want somebody to have to copy-paste four IP addresses somewhere else so that they can actually use the systems automatically. You need a way to consume, if you like, the output of this provisioning system and put that wherever else it needs to be. Um, if you're going to have an application deployment tool or something, you need to, for instance, register those new servers with this other system. And of course, once that environment gets torn down again, you need to make sure that they disappear from this other system as well. So as you start to build out your tool chain, it's not just about what can the individual tools do, but how do I make sure that the data that one of the tools produces can easily be moved into the other tools that then need to consume it. Oh, well, that's good, we're gonna move this through quickly. All right, so deployment. Um, Application deployment is specifically what we mean here. And um, whether you need to do this as a separate process depends quite strongly on how your delivery model is set up. Uh, I like to distinguish kind of between two types of delivery models, or at least those are the extreme ends of the spectrum. At the one end of the spectrum is what I call the, the virtual appliance style model. And that's basically where your developers, like the thing that comes out of your build process is an entire system. Um, it's, a, it's a Docker file, it's an AMI, it's a, a vagrant setup, but whatever it is, it's just something that you can take and uh, you boot it and everything is running. Um, and that's, that's great, that's very convenient. It can be a bit heavyweight because things like AMIs are big things to push and move around. Um, but certainly, you know, it works especially if you allow your developers to have or you trust them to deliver the entire system in a working state. Um, this is, of course, not a new concept, even though it's become very popular recently because of some new technologies. But you know, this is what I, people like uh, F5 have been doing with Big IP for ages. You download a virtual appliance and you boot it, and then you you know you trust them to get everything right. The OS is correctly configured, SSH is securely set up, all that kind of stuff. And if you have that model of, of delivery, then you know environment provisioning and application deployment pretty much becomes the same thing, because version 3.5, you know, you just need to put it up on Amazon and you're done. That's nice, that's pretty convenient. But at the other end of the spectrum, and you know, this is a model that we still tend to see more frequently because it, it, it matches better what organizations are doing, is the kind of pass, I like to call it the pass type model, where you have a, a distinction, a pretty clear distinction between the platform, which is like the runtime, the middleware, or whatever you call it, and then you have the app layer. And the developers are responsible for the app layer. That's what they deliver in their build process. And then there's another team uh, that is responsible for the platform layer. And that can be an outsourced provider if you're running in a cloud pass, or it can be something you stand up yourself. But they have different life cycles. Um, you first make a platform of a specific version, for instance. Um, or that can be one that already exists, like you probably wouldn't stand up a new Cloud Foundry just to deploy an app on it. And then you put the application on top of it. So this is an application to your deployment more in the, in the classic sense. And this, well, the reason we, I think we still see this as being more common is because it doesn't just match, um, well, it, the technology is, is, it works, but it also, matches what organizations feel works from a process perspective. You know, they don't trust developers to set up the entire OS correctly. Developers don't typically care about that. They just want to get their app code running. Um, this allows the, the, the ops team or the DevOps team, as it's probably called nowadays too, it's kind of ironic, DevOps team, but they only do platform stuff, um, to figure out what they need to do and provide as a service uh, what the application developers need to consume. So what are the challenges in this space? Well, that really depends on, on what your applications look like. But typically, some of the challenges we see here are multi-machine orchestration and support for things like, uh, like high availability deployments or blue-green deployments or canary deployments, the kind of things that people want to do. Um, and yeah, it, it's a two-line, you know, if your app is really just, I'm gonna push this binary over here and start a process, then you have a trivial deployment. But most rural deployments look something like, I need, I have like 100 servers or 10, and I want to uh, do a high availability deployment, so I'm gonna do maybe two first as a kind of canary, and then four and four. 
So I need to take the first two out of the load balancer, then I need to deploy the code to them, then I need to put them in a new pool, move some users over, see whether that works. If that works, great, then we'll do the next four in parallel, and then we do the last four. So this is this kind of multi-machine orchestration stuff that typically you end up having to glue yourself. Um, and you know, that's something worth bearing in mind. If, you, if you're, that's what you're doing, you can avoid this by having different, uh, different app delivery structures. But if that's what you need to do, then it's worth looking at a tool that specializes in this kind of stuff. There's a bunch of app delivery tools out there, uh, and they can provide this kind of stuff out of the box. The other thing, and this is very much what, you know, what a pass concept also does, is to say, look, you really want to have a cookie cutter approach to your deployments. Um, of course, there will always be unicorns in every organization. If you have an app portfolio of like 200 applications, then they're not all going to be deployed the same way. But chances are 75% maybe will, because they're very simple applications. Um, and you don't really want 75% of your apps that could all be deployed the same way to be deployed totally differently, because developers write a deployment script, and every development team decides to do it slightly differently. So ideally, you want to have a setup where you know, you can have a standardized approach for those cookie cutter applications um, that you have, and then for the 25% or 20% or whatever that are really unicorns, people can do whatever they need to do. So if you look at deployment tooling, also think about, you know, does it support some notion of standardization with an escape hatch so that I can do what I need to do, but for the vast majority of cases, I can just define my process once and not have to worry about unnecessary variation. Because certainly in a deployment context, variation causes problems. St stuff breaks. Uh, the most reliable process is one that you run the same way every time. And of course, there's a bunch of other kind of classic deployment problems that everybody who's ever written a deployment script has had to solve. That's like, how do I handle environment-specific variables? Dev is not quite the same as test, is not quite the same as QA, and so on. Um, how do I make sure certain people get access to the test environment, but not the QA or the production environment, et cetera? So test management, another category of tooling that you can uh, think of. Um, and uh, actually, this is one that, that a CI server like Jenkins can cover reasonably well, depending on how many tests you run and what their output format is. But what we're really talking about here is, as I said, is more and more test tools. They produce more and more output data. And in order to make smart decisions about should this version go live or not, you need to somehow look at all this data as a single unit. Um, and I wish it were the case that you could simply say, oh, look, all the tests passed, great. Um, that must mean it's good to go. One test failed, nope, we're not pushing this live. But you know, <laughs> any real project I've ever worked on, it's never been the case that all the tests always pass. There's always four or five that you know you just know. There's the there's flaky ones, or there, nobody bothered to investigate why they failed, but it doesn't really matter. And, um, long story short, Making this go no go decision is more complicated than just saying are all the tests green or not in any real life situation. What you're really looking at in general is change in performance over time or change in behavior over time. And that's especially true of performance tests. Like if you ask people, so when is a performance test green? It's typically not, oh, well, 100 milliseconds, that's our hard cutoff. What you look at when you look at performance testing results is has this particular change made the performance of the system worse? or better with respect to maybe the last 10 test runs or the last day's worth of data from production or whatever. So you need to have some kind of tooling in general uh, to try to first of all allow you to define all these tests together that they belong together because they're all the tests for this release candidate and then they, you want to analyze these tests in comparison with maybe the last five or 10 or whatever test runs to go make that decision. And of course, the more you can automate that process, the better once you start trusting your decision-making process. You know, uh, performance deviation less than 10% with respect to the last 10 test runs. If you can define that as an automated query, great. Then you don't have to do it you know, visually anymore. Um, but you need some kind of tooling to support this. Um, and then there's a kind of future problem that a lot of people don't have yet, which is good, but it's worth knowing that it's coming. As you start having more and more tests, unfortunately, there's no free lunch. Tests aren't free. Um, adding tests also adds cost and time in terms of running them. And both of those can have a negative impact on your continuous delivery throughput. So 
at some point you get to the stage where you have to say, look, we can't run all the tests all the time. We have to somehow make a smart decision about which are the right tests to run for this context. Um, and continuous delivery helps with this because you're hopefully trying to make relatively small changes to the system. Um, if you're changing the color of the UI, one of those classic toy examples again, um, you, c you don't want to run like basic performance tests to make sure that weirdly, you know, there's no butterfly effect going on here, but you don't have to run the full performance test suite for what's essentially a UI only change, but you may want to run a lot of your UX tests to figure out whether the contrast is right or whatever it is that you're doing there. What I'm trying to say is that, you know, the type of change you're making to the system can determine which tests that you want to run. And uh, people like Google do this in a very sophisticated and complex way automatically um, with, with a bunch of interesting AI behind it, making a dynamic choice of the test sets they're going to run based on an analysis of the code commits that are actually in this particular um, pipeline run, which is cool stuff and I don't think anybody has the problem to the extent that they need to invest what Google invested to make this work. But it's worth thinking about how can I make more context-specific tests? How can I say something like, well, for this one I want basic performance and security testing, but full UI testing and uh, maybe full regression testing or something like that. Um, pipeline orchestration. Uh, that's kind of fun in a CD talk because you know everybody, if you ask everybody uh, about CD, they say, oh, yes, a pipeline. Uh, but it's always some kind of conceptual thing that they talk about in their mind. Um, and you can draw it on a, on a piece of paper or in a Visio diagram or something, but at the end of the day, if you're going to get this thing to run, you need to have something in which you define all the various steps. And of course, CI servers are a great candidate here, and you know, those of you who have been to some of the talks here will have seen lots of interesting new features um, that are designed to make this easier to do specifically in Jenkins and to provide more of a domain model support for the, the concept of a pipeline. Um, but there are some things that we see in the real world when trying to do this that might make you think, you know, maybe a CI server isn't the only tool I want to use for this. Uh, and some of those are, if you want to do the whole end-to-end -end process, how much variation and how much manual stuff actually happens. Um, great if you're at the point where your entire process is automated and standardized, but the reality for most people we speak to is that that's not the case. So then you have two choices. You have the kind of split brain approach where you say, oh, well, we'll use the CI tool or whatever orchestrator we have for that bit of the pipeline that is standardized and automated, and then we go back to Confluence or emails or something and kind of pretend that that <laughs> doesn't exist. Um, but that doesn't help you really, it doesn't help you get a, a real view of the end-to-end -end process that you're actually running. And it also doesn't really help you see where the waste is, where the problem is. Um, so the ability to have a v view of the end-to-end -end pipeline visualizes what the problem is and allows you also to handle, yeah, even if it's, you know, you have a manual approval process, you have a cab meeting, you have a change review, whatever. If you can put that in an orchestrator, you can define that somewhere, then at least you can see what you're doing. And going back to the story I was telling uh, about the guy from the consulting company, you have a place where you can track the time that each of these particular events is taking. And then you can say, oh my goodness, you know, we're spending six hours out of every 12 hours in one of these pipeline runs on manual QA. Um, this is not what we should be doing because it's taking too long. Um, and then you get to the inside problem. So this is a, I like to think of ultimately what are we doing? We're providing software to people. It's a supply chain problem. It shouldn't really be any different from ordering a book on Amazon. And when you order a book on Amazon, you click a button, it goes into your cart, you buy it, and what do you get? You get some kind of order status page or history or something, and it gives you, as a customer, very high-level information. This is what you've ordered, this is where it is roughly, which stage, and this is when we think it's going to get there. If you don't like that, hit this button to complain. That's the kind of view that you get. Um, if you're a customer of software, well, right now, you're probably not getting any view whatsoever. They just promise you it'll be there in three weeks and then it takes six months and it's not the book that you ordered. Like it's a terrible consumer experience if you think about it. But if you're going to start building a pipeline uh, and you're going to start to have somewhere where you can track the history and the movement of an item such as this, then you also think about why not let your customer do what they can do with Amazon. Have a look at it and figure out where is my fix my feature, my request, whatever, in this pipeline. 
But that requires certain things. First of all, you need to know which fixes and features are actually in a current pipeline run. So that requires some kind of integration with your issue tool or your ALM tool or something like that. And it probably also requires a higher level kind of abstraction than you typically get from something like a, a, a command invoker or a, a CI tool because that to me is a bit like if Amazon took you straight to their fleet tracking system, like you see the truck and the license plate of the truck and who's driving the truck and how much sleep that person's had and you know, where the truck is headed on which, I don't want to know any of that kind of stuff. That's what the manager needs to know if I complain to him or her, but I just want to tell, want to see is it, when's it going to be there. Um, and, and then the final thing that you might want to think about when you talk about orchestration is um, where are we right now in our maturity level? Are we where we want to be or do we actually want to improve? No, there's a long way we still want to go. Your process will change over time, hopefully, and hopefully get better. Um, but there are some tools, some orchestrators that are highly opinionated about the kind of process they support. Um, for instance, there are some that you know, require you pretty much to do a fully automated end-to-end -end process. And that's great if that's what you have. But personally, I don't think it's very useful to have a tool that says, well, please first go away and do all this complicated work, and then you can come back and you can use the tool. Because you've really done all the hard part without the tool helping you. I like the idea of a tool helping you to get there, but that means that you have to have a tool that can deal with your process as it exists today, which means probably not fully automated, and it probably means it's not quite the same every time. Oh no, we forgot, we need to like change this switch over here. Let's add a task to the process for this run. That's not what you want to do next time. All right, so go oh, over the speed up now. Got carried away there. Um, so how do you introduce a toolkit? Um, yeah, and then for those of you who are, we don't get to the bonus item, that was the kind of end user monitoring stuff. If you're interested, just drop by the vendor area, I'll be around and happily talk about that. Um, but how to introduce a toolkit? So think about you know, how existing tool sets um, got introduced to your organization. And especially, unfortunately, there's usually better examples of how it didn't work very well than how it worked very well. Like, I think ITIL, for instance. Who's been through an ITIL transformation? Yeah. Anybody like that? Yeah. So, um, top-down kind of mandate, this is the tool set that you will use. You must use this tool set. Doesn't go down very well, especially with, you know, developers and, and uh, us kind of folks. But there is a trade-off to be made in organizations. You know, Variation is, is good at some level. Monoculture is bad because you never are open to new ideas, but unnecessary variation just costs overhead and time. So in an ideal world, it's like, you know, find a couple of teams that are doing this well, we're having success with their tools, try to get some understanding about whether the tools that they're using actually apply to other teams. So in just because they happen to be doing a good job with like Puppet Chef and Jenkins or, or XR release and, and something else doesn't mean that their context works well for another team. And then kind of roll it out across a couple of teams if you think it works. And then say, okay, well, you know, this is what we're going to try and adopt as a standard. And if you think that this isn't going to work for you, we're going to let you do what you need to do. But you have to uh, describe why. And that will help you identify the unicorns that you have in your organization. Um, one challenge that comes with this is that organizations tend to have a, uh, a kind of high-level mandate to try to reduce the number of tools that they have because their experience is, you know, more tools means more glue, more potential interfaces that can break. Wouldn't it be nice if we had one tool that could rule them all? And unfortunately, I think, you know, the reality in the CI CD space, oh, no, um, in the CI CD space is that that doesn't really work very well. Um, of course, there are a bunch of vendors out there that will say, look, we have everything, the box, this is it, this is your CD box, bring the CD box and then you're done. But that doesn't really work all that well. Um, it is a best of breed environment largely. There is relatively good use cases for how to glue the different bits together in a reasonably nice way. And if you find that you're trying to use, you know, we've decided we're only going to use a, a CI server and a provisioning tool. And if you find that they work really nicely for you and they don't pose challenges, great. But if you find that you're kind of like, oh, I'm pulling the tools too much, uh, and you're trying to overstretch them and you have to pour a whole bunch of glue into the middle, uh, don't feel that you've got to have, you, you have to make this work because LinkedIn made it work and if they can make it work, I can make it work as well. 
there is room for multiple tools in this space because it depends on the kind of problem you have. So don't be afraid to try out another tool in there and see if it fits. Um, but yeah, there's some organizational inertia generally that you have to overcome with these things, especially, of course, when people have chosen tools or chosen tools already and they're like, this is, this is my tool, I will fight for it. So I'll skip the plug because you can come and see me at the table. Um, thank you, of course, uh, to our sponsors and for you for listening.